Okay, so um, what I'm going to do today is just talk about um, uh, some work that we're doing in the UK um, to uh, try and make research information management and reporting um, a little bit easier. Um, so, oh, let me just see if I can use the... Okay, so this is who I am. My name is Ben Showers. Um, I work for JISC um, in the UK. Um, my role is Head of Scholarly and Library Futures. Um, so it's a very grand job title, but essentially what that means is my role is um, working in the futures division of JISC, um, looking for opportunities, um, looking kind of horizon scanning, understanding what's coming up, um, and working with institutions, working with universities and colleges within the UK um, to understand um, how we can support them, where we might collaborate, where there are opportunities, the kinds of services, the kinds of advice and guidance um, that would support those institutions. Um, my email's there, um, so is my Twitter handle. Um, I always find that I have the best questions on the train home, on the plane home after a conference. So if you want to ask me a question and you're sitting on the plane or something like that, they have Wi-Fi in planes now, um, do feel free to email me or, or tweet me. Um, I'm going to assume that most of you um, have heard of JISC or have a fairly good idea of JISC, you know, who we are, what we do. Um, I thought I'd very briefly just kind of give you the, the high level kind of stuff. Um, so JISC is obviously a UK organisation. Um, we're there really to support um, higher and further education, so universities and colleges within the UK um, to um, support them in the use of digital technologies um, for learning, teaching and research. So our vision, our mission is to make the UK the most digitally advanced education sector in the world. That's what we're there to do. Um, JISC uh, used to be a um, kind of quasi-governmental body. So we used to have, you know, um, sit under HECI, the Higher Education Funding Council within, um, and the other funding councils for Wales and Scotland within UK. Um, we're, now an organ we're now a charity. Um, so while we're still um, almost entirely government funded, we have charitable status. So that gives us a bit more flexibility. That allows us to do more things. Um, JISC has, in, transfer, in transforming into a charity, JISC also looked at its internal structure as well. So JISC now has four kind of key um, divisions, um, and they are technology and infrastructure. So that would include JANET, the joint, uh, the joint academic network, so the, net the network that all universities and colleges use in the, um, in the UK. Um, content and discovery, um, so that includes things like JISC collections, who negotiate licenses on behalf of the sector. Um, then there's Futures, which is my division, the bit that I sit in. Um, so that's looking at horizon scanning, understanding the kind of challenges, the opportunities that are, are sitting out there on the horizon and working with institutions to, um, to understand their requirements and their needs. And then finally, um, we have Customer Experience, which has a kind of dual role. That's both marketing and comms within JISC, but also the kinds of advice and guidance, those kinds of um, training services that JISC offer to the community as well. So things like JISC Leave and stuff like that. So that's JISC. JISC is one organisation, but those four kind of key um, divisions within it. So I plan to talk for about 40 minutes, I reckon, and that depends on um, how, how much I kind of go off topic. But I, I think around about 40 minutes. I'm very conscious of the fact that I stand between you and lunch. Um, and that's not a great place to be situated. So um, we'll, we'll, I'll talk for about 40 minutes and then we can take questions and things like that at the end. Um, I'm not going to start by telling you about um, the project that I'm here to talk about, about CASRAE. Um, I'm going to start by talking about the context, the reasons why we're engaging in this project, um, why we're collaborating with this organisation called CASRAE. So I'm going to give you a bit of context, a bit of the landscape about research in the UK, about scholarly communications landscape within the UK, and what, what the drivers are for some of the work that we're doing around research information management. Then I'm going to give you a bit of background about the organisation CASRE, who we're working with, we're collaborating with on this particular pilot, on this particular project. I'll also tell you what CASRE stands for, um, which will be uh, a, crucial, a crucial part of understanding what CASRE and this project is, is hoping to do. I'll then talk to you a bit about the project, a bit about the pilot that the UK is working with CASRAE on. And then finally, I want to very briefly touch on some of the implications of this project um, for other things. Other things that JISC are doing um, and other projects that are happening in the UK, but also other things that are happening internationally, some things that you'll probably be aware of, like SHARE, for example, in the US. Um, so I'm not going to dwell on those too much, but I just want to kind of finish by 
just surfacing those connections, surfacing those implications. Okay, so. So let me start by talking about research within the UK. So, 20, so this year, 2014, um, is the first year that institutions, that researchers are submitting their research outputs um, to a new um, kind of impact framework called the REF, Research Excellence Framework. I nearly forgot what that meant for a second, and that would have been horrendous. <laughs> research excellent fra Excellence Framework. So this is a new um, way that the UK government is um, evaluating, I guess, um, research outputs. So understanding um, the, the impact of those research outputs. Um, and this has been huge. This has effectively um, transformed the way that institutions are judged um, within the UK. Um, it's a star rating, I think it's up to five stars or something like that. So if you're an institution, you're putting everything into this. So this year was the first year that they submitted to REF. So that's a big game changer. The next time will be 2020. The government, UK government also announced yesterday, so hot off the press people, that post-2016, let me just read this out so I don't, I don't misquote it. Um, so post-2016, so for the next REF exercise in 2020, um, articles and conference proceedings that have been peer-reviewed must be deposited in an institutional or subject repository on acceptance for publication. So that's a mandate by the UK government. Um, so post-2016, 2016, anything published has to live, once it's been accepted for publication, has to be deposited in an institutional repository, effectively. So this year, so running up to 2014, most institutional, their mission, their vision for managing their research information and reporting was essentially, we just have to do this. There was no, you know, they just threw everything into, into, into this. By 2020, institutions will have to have in place a well-oiled machine. They can't do this um, in an, on an ad hoc basis anymore. It has to be, by 2016 to 2020, this has to become a well-oiled machine. The way that they report this stuff, the way they demonstrate that they're complying to these mandates. And these mandates aren't going to stay still. These are going to be constantly evolving, I suspect, and new ones will be coming in. And the other big thing for, uh, for the UK research community as well is open access. That's probably the biggest um, kind of compliance issue for many institutions, demonstrating that they're complying to these mandates by the UK government. And at the moment, that's a very difficult thing to do to demonstrate, to make each, you know, to be able to get reports out of your systems to demonstrate that information. They're all hang, hand cranked, as it were. And then there's the kind of broader changes as well. So the changes around things like being able to track funding and understand those different sources of funding. So the UK government is no longer necessarily the de facto point at which research, or the place from which researchers get their funding. Increasingly, it's coming from industry, um, from commercial and other non-governmental sources. So being able to track those and understand where those sources are coming from, what the compliance and what the kinds of reporting um, requirements are from those other um, funders. Increasingly as well, research, as we all know, is becoming increasingly in international, interdisciplinary. Um, the project teams are becoming more complex. They're cross-institutional, uh, cross, you know, national, international, and so forth. So again, tracking those, those collaborations, tracking those things is becoming much more complex. And then finally, for, certainly for UK institutions, and I suspect it's the same around the world, um, Research is one of those big kind of flag-waving things. This is often what the brand of the institution rests upon. And post-2016, coming up to the 2020 REF exercise, that's going to become even more the case. Um, you know, the effort that institutions will want to be putting into this will be enormous. Um, so this is an opportunity for institutions to raise their profile. Um, so you, can, you kind of get a sense of th those kind of the changes both within the broader landscape but also within the kind of governmental kind of um, UK policy landscape as well. Um, at the moment, oh. um, this is a really kind of uh, basic image, but this is just to give you a kind of understanding of um, 
the, the systems that sit within the university, so those kind of finance, some of the things which are relevant to um, research reporting, finance, the repository, CRISIS, so current research information systems, which again at the moment tend to be very kind of uncoordinated ad hoc um, systems. Um, they also tend to quite often be augmented with spreadsheets and things like that. Um, and then in the kind of research council reporting side of things, those systems there, ROS, Research, Fish and Jazz, um, we're nothing if not lovers of acronyms, um, are the kinds of systems that researchers and institutions have to report to. So JES is the joint e-submissions um, portal. So if you're a researcher in the UK and you have government funding, uh, you know, you want to apply for a grant or something like that, you use that system to, su to submit your, um, your application. Research Vision ROS are research output systems. So that's telling them, you know, what the output of that piece of research was, who the collaborators were, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just a very, very simplistic kind of picture of that, that relationship between those two, um, those two kind of institutions, those two sets of uh, systems. And despite, I mean, this is incredibly simplified, so I've taken that right down to its very basics, but despite those kind of, what's there, six different systems, and ultimately they're ecosystems within each of those systems. So they're often, you know, lots of other things are plugged in. They're hand cranking stuff from other systems. They've got spreadsheets, et cetera, et cetera. Despite all of this data, despite wallowing in this kind of morass of data, um, it's almost impossible to get any meaningful analytics or data out of those systems. Um, and that, again, post-2016, when the institutions are gearing up for the REC in 2020, that's going to become critical. Um, at the moment, you know, it's very <coughs> hard to get really meaningful, um, really kind of rich um, analytics data out of these systems. Um, and ultimately, you know, that's the kind of data that strategic and day-to-day -day management decisions will be made upon. So, so if that's the policy, so I've talked about the policy side of things and given you a kind of picture of the system side of things. So the system side of things, as I said, um, is generally fairly uncoordinated and ad hoc. The systems are pretty immature, as is the particular profession that we're talking about, the people who do this kinds of stuff, the research information managers. Um, it's a relatively young profession, there's no kind of official um, qualification, um, and while they're doing an incredible job against all the odds, um, they're still doing it against the odds. The odds aren't stacked in their favour, let's put it that way. Um, and as I said, the systems landscape is complex. You've got local systems, you've got governmental systems, and then you've also got shared systems and other kinds of collaborative systems that institutions are trying to work on um, to take away some of this burden. So things like UCRIS, which is the UK Research Information System as a Shared Service. Um, so trying to make, a kind of, you know, do a, an above campus system for research information management. Um, Similarly, if the institutional uh, context is complex, so is the, the funder um, system uh, landscape as well. Multiple um, reporting systems. Um, there are also other bodies within the UK like HESA, which is the Higher Education Statistics Agency, um, which also requires um, institutions to submit um, data to them as well. And as I said, um, at the moment, getting information, meaningful, uh, meaningful kind of data out of these, actually using these as analytical tools is, is pretty much impossible. It's, you know, it's very hard. So, so this really is where CASRAE comes in. So CASRAE is a Canadian organisation. Um, it stands for, and I'm going to read this off the slide because I always forget, uh, Consortia Advancing Standards in Research, Administration and Information. Okay. So um, this is really a kind of community-led collaborative membership organisation. Um, it's Canadian. I think the UK is the first um, kind of international partner. I think they're also looking at other northern European countries and the US as well as potential partners. But the UK is, is, um, is their first kind of international partner. I and mean, what Casway does is it maintains and develops, or it develops and maintains um, a dictionary, a data, a common data dictionary. So um, what, it, what that means is it really means it kind of advocates on particular standards, on best practice around those standards, um, on particular vocabularies, particular um, um, 
uh, yeah, vocabularies and, and kind of best practice surrounding those um, uh, vocabularies for institutions and funders. Um, David Baker, who's the executive director, um, has this wonderful quote. And he always says that um, res the research community internationally um, generally captures largely the same types of data. So it across almost every single country, we capture the same kinds of data. But there are three obstacles that divide us meaning, structure, and format. And ultimately, that's what CASRA is there to do. It's to try to define those particular things, the meaning of those words, those vocabularies that we use, the structure of the kinds of reports and things like that that we're submitting and using, and the format, what they look like. Oh, gone the wrong way. OK. So the kinds of things that CASRA tries to define, the terminology that it tries to um, to uh, define are things like, uh, well, it, it all relates to the management of research. So things like uh, academic CVs, um, research grants, the data management plans, um, controlled vocabularies, um, authoritative lists, so, so things like, you know, simple things like institutional, authoritative institutional lists um, and identifiers. And so it aims to be um, a single source, a single point, an unambiguous source um, for data profiles. Um, and by being an unambiguous uh, single point of contact for those sorts of things, it also means it can work with multiple, you know, it's agnostic in terms of kind of vendors. Um, it works alongside other standards agencies and other kinds of um, projects in this space, interoperability projects, so things like Serif, um, um, there's other projects in the UK that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, so, you know, it's kind of in agnostic in terms of the technology that, that institutions use as well. Um, ORCID as well. So ORCID's a really good example. I don't know if anybody's come from the ORCID um, presentation this morning, but ORCID is one of those partners that's working with CASRAE so that ORCID would potentially become the ID, the researcher ID um, that is, you know, used within the dictionary. So, so what JISC and CASRAE were interested in doing was understanding whether the CASRAE approach, whether that idea of this dictionary would um, be a viable approach for the UK research uh, information management community. With this work, could we pilot this as an approach within the UK? So, um, and Casway was very attractive, given the kind of context that we're talking about, this kind of research landscape that we're talking about, and the kind of fluidity of it, um, and the complexity of it, both in terms of the policy landscape and the systems landscape. Casway is very attractive. So what we're, we're working with Casway on is piloting three working groups within the UK to explore three um, priority areas. So we had a meeting in December of last year, 2013. Um, and that meeting um, worked with stakeholders and experts across the UK to try to define the kind of priority areas that we should look at. So the, work, the areas we should work with CASRA to try to define the kinds, the kinds of terms, the kinds of vocabularies that we want to use within those areas. Um, and they were the top three areas that we decided we'd focus on were data management plans, authoritative lists, or organisational lists, sorry, for, institutionals, for institutions, and research reporting, so things like open access reporting, the kind of requirements um, that surround that. Um, so data management plans were a big one. They were probably the biggest um, one um, for obvious reasons. Um, in particular because of the increasing kind of requirements from research, uh, research funding organisations around having a, a data management plan in place. How do you demonstrate that you have that in place? How do you report that effectively and seamlessly? Um, so what we, we're doing is um, that that particular working group is building on the work of the of JISC's DCC, the Digital Curation Centre, um, and they've developed a tool called DMP Online, which is Data Management Plans Online. So it's building on that work um, to try to use that as a basis for um, a particular uh, approach to, to um, data management plans within the UK, for UK institutions. Um, we're also working with the funding councils as well to understand whether or not the, 
um, the DMP online is is fully sufficient? Is there other stuff we should be bringing into that? You know, what are the funding requirements, um, reporting requirements, and how might that change that um, that data management plan? So that's the first part. So that's the first thing we're working with the um, with the Casre group on. The second are the organisational lists. So um, what are the best um, lists, organisational lists that exist out there already? Are there ones that we can borrow, such as um, <coughs> Disney, Ringgold and so forth? So it's evaluating those, understanding the benefits of those particular ones. Um, and it's also about trying to understand how we make this sustainable. So it's not just something which we, okay, we make a decision about um, what will be our authoritative list, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But how do we make this sustainable? How do we um, make sure this is updated and this is kept alive? Because that's the other issue as well. Um, and so there are opportunities with Casway. That Casway is that one single point whereby things like APIs or machine-to-machine -machine kind of technology, you can make sure that you're able to keep those sorts of things up to date. And then finally, but maybe most importantly of all, is the research reporting. So the real driver behind this, I guess, um, or why this has become such a challenge is because of open access. So the requirements on institutions to report, um, or rather to demonstrate their compliance to these particular mandates. Um, so again, this is really, um, to some extent, um, trying to understand what the requirements are from the funding councils, nailing them down on those, and then developing a kind of um, a set of terminology, a reporting format um, that is applicable to them, and that in, uh, researchers have, for example, a single profile that then populates all those different systems with, with whatever information those different systems require. So if you think back to the research, uh, sorry, the, yeah, the funders, government funders box, um, those three different res um, reporting systems, they are just automatically updated with the kinds of information that those funders need in terms of OA compliance. Um, it's probably also, also worth just mentioning as well that as a result of that summit where the decisions were made about the three priority working groups, there were other things that came up that people thought were very important. Um, so things like um, uh, ethics, I think ethics reviews, and also research equipment profiles as well. Um, but we've stuck with the three highest priority things, but they will review those other ones um, and you know, I suspect as well as the landscape changes, other priorities will emerge. But for the moment, um, it's those three things, data management plans, organisational lists, and research reporting. So, if standards and interoperability isn't enough to get your, your juices flowing, then governance, surely, is, um, is, is the next big thing. So, um, the other thing about the CAS, piloting Casway in the UK is not just this it's not just about understanding how, um, how we can benefit from having this kind of uh, this dictionary, this kind of single source of unambiguous um, uh, kind of data profiles and so forth. But it's also about understanding how we keep this up to date, how we engage the community in this project as well, and how we make that young profession of research, professions of, of um, research information managers a part of this as well. And so um, the pilot project is also about understanding the governance, and about understanding about um, how we, um, we kind of build up this group of, of experts and of stakeholders around this particular project. So um, the CASY UK um, Working Group, or National Network, I think as it's called, is, um, starts with a national review circle, which is a lovely term, I think. Um, and that is... So in conjunction with the working groups, which are kind of the hands-on stuff, the National Review Circle is a broader range of, of people, experts and stakeholders within that group, and they review the work of those working groups. So they see what those outputs are, um, they comment on them and they review them. And so it's the, wor it's the working groups who are developing um, the different outputs, the different drafts of the idea, and they, those are then fed up to these circles, this broader group of stakeholders and experts. Um, and the, the circle ensures that the standards um, are fit for purpose, ultimately, um, that they're applicable, um, and that they are, they are kind of the sense check layer, I guess, um, in that. 
but the circle is really a way to build up that community to a large extent and that's that's ultimately what this is about it's probably you know we're talking a lot about those kinds of technologies the systems machine to machine communication those kinds of things but actually ultimately it probably comes down to the people making sure they have the right kinds of skills and they have the kinds of infrastructure in place that enable them to do the things the reporting working with the researchers that they need to be doing so I have another picture for you here so in some ways this is again this is very very simplified this is maybe a kind of end um, point this is maybe a kind of picture of where we'd like to get to. So you can see there, there's the researcher, he has the opportunity to, to submit his, um, his information once via a web form which is automatically populates the various um, government um, databases and systems. At the institutional side of things, um, information can come from the repository, from the current resource information manage, uh, from the current research information system and from elsewhere. And then sitting in between these systems and these endpoints, the place where the data is captured and the research funders tick the boxes and, and pat everybody on the back, sit these different um, pieces of the puzzle, the different the schemas that will be used, um, the different semantic um, layers and the APIs, the machine to machine stuff as well. So I've talked a bit about Serif um, and so Reox and V for OA are again other projects that we're working on in the UK. V4OA is vocabularies for open access. Um, so very simply, um, actually that maps really nicely as well to some NISO work that NISO, NISO are doing around open access identifiers or indicators, I think it's called. Um, so essentially it's very similar to the NISO work in terms of developing um, some shared vocabularies of the way we talk about open access outputs. Um, so how we define them. But both V4A goes a bit further. It also talks about how you describe things like um, embargo periods and license conditions and things like that. Um, Reox is about repositories again. So Reox is a kind of uh, a profile um, for, uh, for repository um, items. And again, this all feeds into the kind of the way that CASRI is able to um, be this one point for all of those vocabularies. So once those vocabularies have been agreed, they can sit in CASRI and um, essentially be the kind of, I was going to say the smooth operating system, I'm not sure what that even means, but they, they help ensure that those, those flows of data um, go across systems and, and between systems seamlessly. Um, that's the idea at least. Okay, so, so we started off with a very messy picture, I guess. My picture actually didn't demonstrate quite how messy it was, but you have to imagine that it's a very messy picture. This looks messier than my original picture, granted, um, but that's because most of this will exist underneath the, the hood. You won't even know that this is there. It will be, you know, it's not important for researchers or for even research information managers to a large extent. Oh. But what's really important and probably why we're doing all of this kind of stuff is um, because increasingly, well, as I said at the beginning, there is, there is at the moment no way or no very effective way um, and certainly not you know, a kind of above campus level where institutions are able to analyse the kinds of data um, that they're supplying to, to research for, uh, funders, to the government, etc., about compliance. So there's no way for institutions to really effectively track um, where those hot spots are in terms of research, where money's coming from, where are the real kind of you know um, interesting areas, where are the collaborations, where are the really interesting collaborations, and where are those small germs of things, those small seeds of things, which are looking like they could be the next big thing, where the institution might want to think about resources, stuff like that. And increasingly that's going to become more and more important. It's going to become more and more important as well as open access becomes a bigger part of this, this kind of space as well. Um, and the compliance side of things is going to become much more complex. So JISC, um, so something like CASRAE can enable those kinds of things to happen um, much more easily um, and also happen in different places. So JISC Monitor um, is a project which is looking at developing a shared service effectively um, for UK um, universities um, to enable them to kind of get that bigger picture. So it has um, 
Oh, and they're, they're developing a prototype of this service. Um, of a, I don't, I'm not sure how to describe it. I was going to say dashboard. I'm not sure if that's quite right. But by 2015, they'll have a prototype in place. It's literally just started this project. And they've developed, working with, um, they're working with publishers, funders, universities, um, even developers as well. Um, and they've developed four use cases. Um, and those use cases are around monitoring publication activity, um, collaboration, and in this sense, collaboration between systems almost, so that interoperability between publisher systems, institutional systems, and so forth. Um, compliance, so data around compliance, and also uh, APCs, um, so article processing charges, so the charges that publishers charge for open access um, publication. So institutions are able to track those. Um, and the idea is that the um, the service will be uh, a kind of a database, a knowledge base for institutional publication activity, um, connecting publishers to the inf institutional systems, um, analysing publication data to de determine whether or not something's compliant with a funder mandate, um, and data on things like how much they've spent on the open access charges. So at, at the moment it's very difficult for institutions even to track how much they're spending on institutional, on, sorry, um, APCs, on publisher charges for open access. So that's the aim of JISC Monitor. Um, as I say, it's very early stages. It's just starting right now. By 2015, it will be an open source prototype, um, or open source code prototype. Um, and it maps very nicely as well. It's trying to do a very similar thing to something like Share um, in the US. And they had a presentation just before this one. Um, so again, what I wanted to do in this presentation, in a sense, was almost talk about the thing so from the UK perspective, we're, we're almost starting with the things which will enable those, in, those kind of critical pieces of the puzzle that enable things like this to happen. Um, so that interoperability standards and, and those sorts of developments aren't necessarily the most sexiest of things to be talking about. But what they enable, these kinds of things that can be built on top of them, both by the institution themselves, but also for the sector as a whole, um, are very exciting. Um, so that's... That's something which, in the UK, we're very, very excited about. Um, and we're currently kind of, again, Share is in a very similar kind of position in terms of um, their timeline. They're at the beginning, and we're at the beginning. So we're collaborating. We're talking with Share very, very closely. Um, oops. OK, so I think, oops. that's pretty much it. So that's pretty much all I wanted to say today, really. As I say, this is still very early days in the UK for a lot of this stuff. Um, a lot of the things that I've talked about today in terms of CASRI are still um, there. You know, we, had, we made the decision about the three priority working groups in December. It's now April, April the 1st. Honestly, no joke. Um, um, so we're right at the beginning of this. Um, but ultimately, um, we see something like CASRAE and some of those other smaller projects that we've been talking about that will feed into CASRAE, into the dictionary, things like vocabularies for open access, um, things like Serif, um, as enabling these kinds of services, these kinds of systems um, that we can deliver as kind of national services, but also that enable institutions to do stuff at a local level as well, so that they can understand, um, you know, as I said, where their money is going, um, how much they're spending on open access what they're getting from funding into their bodies, what types of funders are they getting, you know, how is that mix of kind of governmental and, and industry funding, what does that look like and how is that changing over time, what does that mean for their strategy and day-to-day -day management <coughs> and things like that. So, I've listed a few things up there which you might want to follow up. Um, in particular, if you go to casray.org, there's another, I should have put it up here, and I've, I really didn't realise until this morning, but there's one called dictionary.casray.org, which is the actual dictionary um, search interface, which is quite nice. And you can actually go there and have a look at some of those kinds of profiles that they, um, that they have in place, some of the CV stuff and stuff like that. So you kind of get a sense of, of what they do a little bit better than just on their website. Um, the, there's a website for the Casray UK project on the JISC website. Um, and there's some other stuff there as well. There's, JISC Monitor has no online presence at the moment. Um, all, all I could find about it was a slide share deck um, from a presentation a few weeks ago. Um, so that's probably, you're, you're at the 
you're at the coal face, you're at the cutting edge. Almost no one else has seen, has seen or heard about JISC Monitor at the moment. So um, some inside news for you there as well. Um, I should also say as well that um, I've, I've also um, been very, very lucky that um, I've got colleagues at JISC who are working very, very closely on the Casway project. Um, uh, Rachel Bruce and uh, Verena Weigert, who's, um, who's kind of, I'm, I'm, I almost feel like I'm channel, channeling them. I'm their mouthpiece. I would just happen to be the one that was in St. Louis. So I should say thank you very much to them. And if I'm unable to ask any questions that you might have, or if you want any more information about the project, um, then do feel free to contact me, but I will probably just pass you on to them because they're much more, um, much more informed than I am. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.